Blog Talk Radio. you back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. We are talking about a book called The Might of Thoughts, which is also known as Macht der Gedanken in the German. It's a book that was written by a man in Switzerland known as Edward Albert Meyer. Most people know him as Billy Meyer. He's about 70 years old. He lives in a tiny mountain village in Switzerland called Hinterschmid Ruti. It's about 52 minutes east of Zurich. Uh, This man has written 39 books, and this is one of the incredible books that he's written. Much of the information that Edward Albert Meyer talks about is spiritual in nature, and we all have a spirit form. Every human being has a spirit form. It's located in an area of the midbrain called the superior colliculus. Uh, This area is the area of our brain that controls sight and the integration of other senses. Uh, 21 days after the sperm fertilizes the egg, the spirit form comes into the body of the child and it animates the entire child It animates all the bodily functions. The heart starts to beat. Um, What also comes in is something called the consciousness block. The consciousness block is our material consciousness, meaning our personality, our subconsciousness, our consciousness, our intellect. And one of the things that we get every time we're born is the wisdom of our predecessor personalities, which is kind of locked in our subconsciousness at this stage in our development. We're not really able to deal with clear recall of all of our previous lifetimes. So, But we get that wisdom, and it's kind of buried in our subconscious, and it uh, gives us a kind of... Um, inspiration as we are going through our lives, we also get these impulses that come from the universal storage banks and the planetary storage banks. And these impulses uh, are its kind of a guidance uh, information. And Edward Albert Meyer has been very sensitive to these impulses his whole life. As a young boy growing up in Bullock, Switzerland, he woke up one morning and went outside and looked up at a a beautiful starry sky, actually. It was probably in the middle of the night, like 3 a.m. And he saw what he called the the light of the stars, but he sensed an invisible light, the light that was the radiating love of what he called creation. And he was flooded with good memories and good feelings, And he knew the purpose of his life and what he was going to do with this life. At a very young age, Billy had a sense of uh, bestimung in the German, a sense of destiny. And much of his sense of destiny came from his sensitivity to the impulses that come from creation. And the impulses that come from these storage banks In the German of all of Billy's writings, there's an evolution code that releases impulses from these storage banks. And when they reach the reader, they start to work in an evolutionary way with him or her. And now this is because the German language originated from the old Lyrian language and has the same amount of characters per word. Uh, 389,000 years ago, some extraterrestrial humans came here from the Lyra Vega system. 
about a million or so of them, and they stayed for a while and they had a civilization. They violated certain creational natural laws. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, most of them left, but some of them stayed behind uh, in a codex, uh, an agreement to kind of help the evolution of the people of the earth because they had damaged our normal evolution uh, with some of the things they did when they were here. So some spirit forms are coming back on the earth uh, these are Lyrians that have died from previous lifetimes, and they come back here on the earth as a part of this agreement. And some of the people in the Figu in Switzerland are functioning under this best among this destiny. However, most of us aren't. Most of us are human spirit. We are human beings. Um, the people of the earth. In the ancient past, um, the civilizations here on Earth, if you go back a million years or so, there was a civilization that settled here uh, in the United States area, particularly in the Southwest. Uh, they destroyed themselves in a nuclear war, and that's how we got our Death Valley. And it's very interesting, these skeletons of red-haired giants are found in our Southwest the Lyrians came here about 389,000 years ago, stayed for a short while. They abused the native earth people, who, by the way, were dark skinned. They called them the Evas, or the ones that had to bear this suffering, whatever it was. I mean, we have some ideas of, of what occurred there. And then the next great civilization was headed by a man named Pelagon who came from, uh, I believe, the Playaran system. And his civilization, I believe, was here for almost 10,000 years. But when Pelagon died, his civilization kind of fell into a bit of anarchy and a tremendous war broke out. And it was thousands of years before people came back. Well, the people that started Atlantis and Lemuria came here about... 133,000 years ago. They had a very advanced civilization and they also destroyed themselves. And the earth took thousands of years to recover from all of these these wars that have taken place here on the earth. And once again, we are rushing towards our own destruction again. And we are rushing to what could be a, a third world war. There is a very dark order that's coming out of our our ruling class. And they're trying to gain control of all the money. They're trying to gain control of everything, in fact. And this group, one of the ways they want to gain control is by bringing in this third world war. Now, how can we stop this? Well, we as a society can stop this through the might of our own thoughts, through education, through understanding how the creational natural laws work. Now, in the preface to the book called The Might of Thoughts, it says, So the book which lies before you is de dedicated to a humankind that is ill in its consciousness, so that it finds, again, the creational natural way it lost long ago. Well, one of these skills that we need to learn is learning to analyze our thoughts because our consciousness is much like a garden and we need to clarify our thoughts. And that sometimes involves a repetition and going over things and identifying thoughts that are healthy thoughts and focusing on those healthy thoughts because our consciousness is much like a garden and if we don't correctly maintain our consciousness, there will be wildly growing negative thoughts which have a confusing and destructive effect. And one of the cycles that we see is the cycle of repeating 
negative thoughts. And they repeat and they come back again and again and again and again. And the reason that that happens is because once we start to focus on negative thoughts, they it goes like this, a pattern forms in that uh, lower thoughts form lower feelings and lower feelings form lower habits and then lower habits form lower circumstances in your life. And this happens unconsciously. We actually have cognition that is unconscious. And much, much mental activity takes place on an unconscious level. And we get this rotation of the thoughts that happens automatically. And we start thinking things, uh, repeating negative things that damage our psyche. And this can lead to insanity if it if it goes on too long. So one of these the thinking skills that we need to develop is the ability to analyze our thoughts and determine when our thoughts have become unhealthy. When they start to produce feelings, that's a that's a clue. They start to when your thoughts produce feelings that are negative, then you realize your thoughts are going down the wrong path. So you need to reach in there just like you have a weed in your garden and pull that thought out and don't let it come back. So that's that's the challenge. Now, we need to make a distinction between thoughts and emotions. Emotions come forth suddenly like a reflex, and they can be very, very intense. Now, those don't even have to be started from a thought. Sometimes emotions just pop right up, and I, sometimes they come up probably from the unconscious or the subconscious. But we need to gain control of those as soon as possible as well. Usually, feelings come on much more slowly and they're from the result of thoughts. So if you have certain thoughts that generate good feelings, good healthy feelings, focus on those thoughts and try to think those thoughts that produce those good healthy feelings because those good healthy feelings will eventually form good habits. And the habits you have lead to better circumstances in your life. So that's one of the keys to your thoughts becoming reality. Now, the human being that is shaken and knocked about by the circumstances of their life, usually that's because they believe themselves to be helpless. And they believe themselves to be helpless against external conditions and influences. So what is an external condition or an influence? A circumstance. What is a circumstance? It's an existing condition, a state of affairs. Conditions include your state of being, your state of health, your social position. And the Might of Thoughts books teaches us that we are actually the Lord and Master of our circumstances. We're the Lord and Master of ourself, of our life. And one of the things we have to practice is self-cognition and self-examination and self-control. And because of what the human being thinks, he eventually makes real. And good and positive thoughts They must be tended and nurtured. We have to nurture and help along those good thoughts. And part of nurturing good thoughts is having a positive opinion of yourself. So if you go spinning into depression about yourself, those are also unhealthy thoughts. Those are also weeds that need to be yanked out. Now, what does it mean to nurture? And you need to nurture neutral, positive thoughts. 
Nurture means to feed and protect. Nurture means to support, to encourage. As during the period of training or development, it means to bring up, to train, to educate. So you're training yourself. And the noun nurture is the act or process of promoting development. So you want to develop these thoughts. You want to cherish these neutral, positive thoughts. You notice I'm not saying completely positive, but neutral positive. Now, if a human being has really bad circumstances in their life, if they're a criminal, if they're a felon, if they're depraved, if they're a person locked in hatred, that's because they've maintained those thoughts over a long time. And your thoughts can be imprisoned by addiction. And you can rotate around in these everlasting cycles of thinking that have no end. Addiction is today considered a brain disease. It's a compulsiveness. Uh, And various parts of your life can be destroyed by addiction. Your health, your finances, your relationships, your career can be ruined. Why? Because you had lower thoughts, which led to lower feelings, which led to lower habits, which led to lower circumstances. Lower habits can be addiction. Now, the the, the difficulty with addiction is that you're engaged in a compulsiveness towards getting a rewarding stimulus. And there are, in your brain, reward pathways. We have a Mesolympic dopamine system. And people get stuck in this reward syndrome. It can be you can eat too much food this way. You can drink alcohol and get stuck in, in the addiction this way. And addictions in many ways are unconscious. They're behaviors that go on unconsciously. You just do them. And the rule is, unfortunately, that the human being does not think always consciously, but we think largely unconsciously. And consequently, the human being is also almost always the unconscious cause of the circumstances. The bad circumstances come from unconscious things. Now, the unconscious is the part of the mind that's inaccessible, but it affects your behavior, it affects your emotions. The unconscious mind consists of the processes of the mind that occur automatically and are not available to introspection. So our unconsciousness has the ability to actually cause circumstances in our life. Empirical evidence suggests that Unconscious phenomena include repressed feelings, automatic skills, subliminal perceptions, thoughts, habits, automatic reactions, uh, hidden phobias. People have hidden phobias and hidden desires. So these are some of the the dangers that we face and, and some of the battle. We have a real battle with our thoughts. On page 44 in the Might of the Thoughts, it says, Furthermore, it is a fact that while human beings want the good and the positive, constantly they are prevented exactly from the achievement of the good and positive because through wrongly steered thoughts, the human being maintains wishes, hopes, and yearnings which in no wise agree with the good and the positive and therefore do not harmonize with them. So what is Billy talking about here. We have hopes and yearnings that sometimes do not agree with what is good. A yearning is a feeling of intense longing for something. A persistent, often melancholy desire can be for advance, uh, adventure, for romance, anything. Sometimes these things are not healthy. We need to own our thoughts. Our thoughts can be controlled and maintained along the right path so that we can learn inner freedom and harmony. Some synonyms for harmony include conquered, unity, peace, 
friendship. The entire creation wants to come into harmonious concord with all people, with all plants, with all animals, with the entire universe. The universal consciousness radiates love. The incredible splendor of nature is the visible expression of the love of creation. And creation is radiating love. Love is the highest principle in creation. And from that principle of love, everything else follows. Every tiny plant, every tiny animal has a purpose in creation. And we are supposed to live and help live. Not live and let live, but live and help live. So you have a responsibility to help the plants, the animals, the human beings in your surrounding. Because in reality, the creation is is one. It's all, it's, it's a tightly woven web. Nature is a tightly woven web. And it's designed to work in harmony. And to harmonize with the creation, you have to harmonize your thinking in a neutral, positive way. And then you'll start to develop the sensitivity to sense the radiating love of creation. That sensitivity is called empfinding. And as I often quote from the Goblet of Truth, it describes nature this way. It, and there's a paragraph in the book called The Goblet of Truth which is entitled, What the Truth Knows to Say. And it goes on and says, Rivers, lakes, stones, animals, plants, bushes, trees, everything that crawls and flies on the earth is a life form with a spirit form. And these spirit forms are on a journey through time which involve many, many lifetimes. And that death, it's just the passage into the world of pure spirit. And these creatures are connected by psychic vibrations, by psychic swinging waves. And you can see this in nature if you watch the movement of the birds as they move as a unit, the movement of the fish in the water. They turn on a dime together because they're connected. Well, we human beings are also connected to creation. But because we live in such a state of what the German describes a sartong, which is to, we're so badly out of control of our good human nature that we can no longer sense our connectivity to all things. And that's why we're destroying the earth. That's why overpopulation is rampant. Now, in 1988, Billy had an interview, and he described self-control this way. He said that self-control one possesses must be self-evident and can only be gained through arduous self-scrutiny. What does arduous mean? Arduous means requiring great exertion, laborious, difficult. So controlling our thoughts and making sure that they are neutral positive sometimes takes a level of effort. Let's continue here. Where every iota of one's thoughts is completely kept completely safe and under control regardless of outside influences. One must not allow even the minutest negative vibration of thought and emotion to radiate. Remember, creation radiates love. So you should radiate love too. And when I say love, I'm not talking about Love that's romantic, love that's sappy and out of control and violence. I'm talking about a wisdom-conditioned love. Not affective love, but effective love. This is a love that has a great respect for all life. It comes from the spiritual consciousness. Remember, you have a material consciousness and a spiritual consciousness. 
The gamut in the spiritual consciousness controls the thoughts and the feelings associated with your spiritual consciousness. The psyche in the material consciousness controls the thoughts and the feelings associated with your psyche. So the challenge is to have your psyche think in a neutral, positive way. Your spiritual consciousness already does because it's connected in some way to the universal consciousness. So what we must not allow even the minutest negative vibration of thought and emotion to radiate or become noticeable to others in any way. We should have a totally neutral, unbiased attitude toward all forms of life at all times. And this should become our second nature. So, now, why do we have such a difficulty with this? Part of this is we have psychically disturbed disturbed human beings on the earth, and we've all been there in certain degrees, (coughs) that can only see black. And they can only see negatively because their perceptive ability has become very limited. Their world of thoughts falls prey to a narrow framework and they can only move in this narrow framework of negative perceptions. And when your thinking gets forced into this negative framework of repeating thoughts, you're almost in a you're in bondage to these to these thoughts and sometimes feelings can come out of these ro- rotating this vicious cycle here's the challenge feelings should not be stifled and you shouldn't force your feelings to be eliminated But we also have to recognize the difference between feelings and emotions. Because usually emotions come suddenly, like lightning, surging, uncontrollable. And sometimes they only last a short duration. Feelings manifest slowly and then are associated with a preceding thought process, quite in contrast to emotions. Emotions typically are not preceded by thought processes. So we exclusively, we are responsible for the creation of feelings. And these feelings can come from conscious thinking or unconscious thinking. And this is something I've just recently learned. We have unconscious thoughts. We have thoughts that we're not even aware of. And sometimes we have feelings that come out of these unconscious thoughts. You ever have a feeling and you're like, wow, where did that come from? And as I said earlier, lower thoughts form lower feelings, lower habits, lower circumstances. Uh, These lower circumstances could be alcoholism, hate, affliction, grief, bitterness, and suffering comes from these. And one of the ways to know that you're in this vicious cycle of lower thinking is that your your thoughts tend to become confused and you'll start to become very tired. And that's a, a warning sign that you've been caught in the trap of repeating psych, cycles of negative thoughts. And these thoughts lead to habits. Habits are regular tendencies that are hard to give up. A habit is a routine of behavior that is repeated regularly and tends sometimes to even occur consciously. And that's how our thoughts affect our health. Our consciousness affects our health. By the mean and the mites of our own thoughts, our consciousness determines the health of the body in many ways. There are other factors, of course, that weigh in there. But we can decline our own health. 
And by the same token, we can help our physical well-being if we have good and healthy thoughts. So you'll have to find out what habits you have. When your thoughts are good, when they're correct, try to go back and think about what kinds of things am I doing that produce good thoughts? Where am I? Uh, At what time is it? What place am I? What am I doing? Uh, All of these things come into play. And the majority of all matters in our life have the roots in the might of our thoughts. And don't let anxiety and fear come in. Because anxiety and fear are very demoralizing. And these anxious thoughts shake the entire nervous system. We need to have neutral, positive, equalized, healthy and happy thoughts which build up our resistance. Try not to have habitual thinking, especially habitual thinking that's negative. You know it affects your appearance. You can have wrinkles emerge in your face because of the misuse of thoughts. Foolish thoughts, self-created suffering, wrongly understood and expressed pride. You have... You can also have a face that's imprinted with strong and pure thoughts. If you are living peacefully and harmoniously, that will help your health, it will help your appearance, and your death will be much easier. You will cross over into the realm of spiritual light in a very peaceful, happy way. Don't let your thoughts drift. Most people allow their boats, their thought boats, to drift unchecked on the ocean of conscious and unconscious intentions. Steer your thoughts into something that's constructive, beautiful, positive, happy, equalized. And then you'll have positive, beautiful, happy feelings. Remember, the thoughts produce the feelings. Okay, Might of the Thoughts, page 174, reads like this. Rather, each should help every individual live. As I said earlier, live and help live. One way to live and help live is through the peace meditation. And today was the peace meditation. And the peace meditation is something that the play are instituted on our world, and they they say one phrase over and over and over again. It's spoken in Lyrian: Salam, Gam, Nan Ben Erda, Ganiber, Asala Hesperona, and it means peace to the earth and to all beings. And you can look up on the Figu site when they have these peace meditations. Meditation is a way to learn to control your thoughts. Through meditation, you learn to clear your mind of negative thoughts. You learn to focus. You learn to relax. And learning to relax, and sometimes visualization helps. You think of something blue like a blue sky. A green, something green like a forest of green trees. Just just watch that beautiful forest of green. Watch the trees as they blow in the wind back and forth. Connect with nature again. Think of something yellow like a yellow sun. Think of a red rose or a flame. Focus. Focus on visualization. Breathe deeply, breathe deeply and exhale all that negative energy that you may have. You see, the creational natural laws, nature has laws, the universal consciousness has laws, the primary law is love. And these creational natural laws give help to those who are magnanimous. A person that is magnanimous is very generous or forgiving. 
especially towards a rival or someone who is less powerful than them. A person, when they are magnanimous, is also said to be generous, forgiving insult or injury, free from petty resentment and vindictiveness. If we are magnanimous, somehow the creational natural laws will help us. Now, one of Billy's books is called The O.M., and the word magnanimous is used to describe someone that is growing in the spiritual teachings. And this passage in the O.M. says, His entire sense is magnanimous, and beauty expresses itself in his plain life. Full of spiritual dignity, his inner stillness brings a beauty that no artist can paint and no poet may describe in words. So you can have an inner stillness that comes through the spiritual teaching. And that's part of the goal of the spiritual teachings, is to produce this inner stillness, this calm, this peacefulness, this quiet. Now this is a peacefulness that doesn't come through religion. It doesn't come through belief. Now belief has a very strong hypnotic effect that leads to inconsiderateness, illogic, to fanaticism, to bondage. Belief is confident in something that it is not susceptible to rigorous proof. And belief has this hypnotic effect. Belief seems to circumvent things like logic, like deductive reasoning. An example of deductive reasoning is all men are mortal, Socrates is man, therefore Socrates is mortal. And Billy it says in his writings that belief is based on wrong and negative thinking and in the rejection and displacement of reality. Because when you go into belief, your thought forms are restricted. There's no new ideas, intentions, imaginations, and wishes, wishes and so forth. You can become estranged from the facts of life. Now, estranged, estranged means uh, feeling alienation. Alienation is a state of being withdrawn or isolated from the objective world, like being indifferent. Sometimes religion can alienate us from the facts of life, can alienate us from deductive reasoning. If the human being consciously steers his or her life according to his innermost creational nature, he or she also love and respects results that come. Again, steering means to guide or control. For example, you steer a vehicle, a vessel, an aircraft by turning a wheel and operating a rudder. We need to steer our thoughts. We need to take control of our thoughts. In order to be great in our consciousness, as well as in our ideas, our thoughts and feelings, in one psyche, we also need not to be submissive. We need to believe that we have the power, to think that we have the power to control of our lives, to control our lives. Submission means ready to conform to the will of others. Submissive also means to be inclined or ready to yield. You know, part of the spiritual life is not yielding, but going on. Learning to develop inner guidance. Learning to trust yourself. Dare to execute reason. And that's what I'm challenging you to do. Dare to execute reason in your life. Be responsible for your life. Be in control of your own life. You can be. Let me read directly what Billy says here. Therefore, also never lapse into submissiveness with regard to human 
regardless of however and whatever he may pretend to be, but also never thus become a submissive slave to imaginary deities, to angels, saints, or anything else. Also, never practice submissiveness with regard to yourself, but always be open and honest, as well as forceful to yourself. Regard yourself as a human, which you truly are, who governs himself in every respect. Even if you're a slave, even if you're in chains, you govern yourself in every respect. You see, the whole point of much of this teaching is taking personal responsibility. To govern means to rule over. You rule over yourself. You exercise restraining influence. You guide yourself. Do not lapse. Do not lapse back. Lapse means to pass gradually into an inferior state or condition. The human being must consider it his or her duty to govern themselves. And if you govern yourself, you'll have a life which is righteous and evolutive. If you govern yourself, you'll have abundance. Abundance is extremely plentiful. You'll have an over-sufficient quantity or supply. And that's what the whole point of the Might of Thoughts book is all about. Governing yourself, taking control of those thoughts to keep your thoughts productive. Now, Edward Albert Meyer is a very interesting individual. He's 78 years old. He's written 39 books. He has written some 700 contact notes, nearly 700. Oh, it could be even more than that. Uh, Billy is a very unusual person. He has had contact and training by extraterrestrial humans the first man was a man named Sfoth, uh, who was about a thousand years old. We here on the earth should live to be a thousand years old. We have a genetic, we are called the genetically manipulated people. We, in ancient times, were genetically manipulated to have shortened lifespans and increased aggression. It's a long story. We'll go back over it again sometime. But the normal lifespan for a human being is a thousand years. Spoth had a normal lifespan. Spoth visited Billy first in 1945 and was Billy's teacher for 11 years. Billy was told many things about what would happen in our future. One of the things that Billy was told about was his previous predecessor lifetimes. You see, Edward Albert Meyer has been Enoch, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Emmanuel, and Muhammad. Now, Enoch, in ancient times, was called Henoch. Elijah was called Eliah. The person we call Isaiah was called Yeziah. Uh, Jeremiah was called Yeremia. Now, the person, according to the Meyer information, the person that we call Jesus was called Emmanuel. The only one that has the same name is Muhammad. All of these spirit forms, or all these lifetimes, come from the same spirit form. The spirit form is known as Nokodamian. That's what the extraterrestrials call it. It's a very, very ancient spirit form. It goes back some 9.6 thousand million years, which means 9.6 billion years. Has incarnated on the earth for the past 13,000 years. Uh, the first incarnation that I talked about in those seven important incarnations was Henoch, that we today call Enoch. And there's a whole series of prophecies that come from Henoch in Contact 215 that talk about our future. And we are in what's called the third millennium right now. The third millennium 
It's a time of confusion and maliciousness that's slowly spreading all over the world. In the third millennium, our leaders will become megalomaniacal. And they're already working to take away our rights of self-determination. So what you need to do is learn the power of your own thoughts. And through the power of your own thoughts, you will determine the circumstances in your life. You see, we are a people that have lost the power of our own thoughts. And because we are sheep, the wolves are coming in. Unfortunately, many people will become indolent and obtuse during this time. Uh, They will be indifferent, and this will create circumstances which can cause uh, aggression. We're seeing violence all over our country. Uh, We are moving towards what is mentioned in the Hanak prophecies uh, as a civil war. My information says we'll have two civil wars, possibly. These are prophecies again. Two civil wars that could lead to the United States broken broken up into five different areas. How can we stop all of that horror from occurring? By the power of your own thoughts, you can take control of the circumstances of your life. Do not allow the dark order to take control of the circumstances of your life. Higher thoughts lead to higher feelings. You'll start to feel better, first sign. Higher feelings lead to higher habits. Your life will start to have productive habits. And then you'll notice the circumstances in your life will change. Part of the purpose of our life is problem solving. The purpose of our life is to evolve our consciousness. And we have a material consciousness which is different every lifetime. Our spiritual consciousness is the same every lifetime except that it grows in knowledge and wisdom. And that's the purpose of our life. Your spirit form located in your spiritual colliculus, you can think of it as a tiny fragment of the universal consciousness. So you have incredible power. Now Billy again was told by Sloth that we're entering into a time called the third millennium. It could last 800 years. Probably will last 800 years. And it started when the Americans dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The biggest problem with humanity on the earth is that we no longer understand what the creation is. And um, let me read what I believe this came from Spoth talking about Billy. He said, what your desire is, what you want to bring the human beings is unity, peace, concord, knowledge, wisdom, love, freedom, and harmony, and more profound truth and cognizant that in the entire creational realm, in the entire universe, everything is one and bound together. We're all part of this same universal consciousness. However, this oneness and connectedness with all and everything is the result of the might and the immeasurable love of creation, which gives everything selflessly and demands no payment for it. The creation universal consciousness does not coincide with our primitive religious concepts about deity. There is no anthropomorphic quality to the creation. The universal consciousness really has no personality in the sense that we think of a personality. It it radiates love without personally loving you. It doesn't rule over your life. You are responsible for controlling your life through the power of your own thoughts. The purpose of your life is evolution of your consciousness, and you will bring back all of those experiences back to the universal consciousness. You were created 
for the purpose of helping the entire universal consciousness to evolve. That's the purpose of your life. And the biggest problem with human beings on earth is our ignorance towards the creation and its laws and recommendations. Now, the Pleiaran used to have bases here on the earth. Um, they left the earth in 1995. And that's when they revealed their true identity. They live some 80 light years beyond our Pleiades in a different space and time configuration on a world called Era. Era, in many ways, is similar to our Earth, similar gravity. It is much like the very pristine Earth thousands of years ago. In, be- in between the wars that occurred uh, when there were extraterrestrial humans here, the Earth is a kind of paradise. It really is a very, very wonderful planet. It has endured very much for many, many years. Probably the greatest problem that we're facing here on the Earth right now is overpopulation. And the problem is our our, our lack of understanding that the problem of overpopulation has nothing, it, it's really not a space problem per se. It's more complicated than that. I mean, there are 6.5 million uh, square miles in, in Antarctica. You can move everyone to Antarctica, but no one wants to live there. We're destroying our forests because we want to live in the moderate areas, in the warm areas where there's fresh water. And we've destroyed our forests, which are the moderators of our weather. The forests control the weather in the way that they control heat, for example, with shade. And in the winter, we the, the forests s- slow down the wind keep the soil from getting too cold. So we don't... When the forests are healthy and large and, vol- and massive, the the hot times don't get so hot, the cold times don't get quite as cold, and we don't have the clash between the hot and the cold uh, wind in the air, and which causes the tornadoes. Uh, so we're seeing extreme weather because of our destruction of the environment. Now, the Pleiaran lived and still live in a perfect kind of balance with their environment. They have lived 50,000 years without war, without disease. They've had 50,000 years of evolution. Now, they there were something like 2,862 extraterrestrial humans on the Earth up to 1995. They left the Earth in 1995. They closed their bases down. They had bases in Switzerland. They had bases in Asia and I believe in North America as well. Now, these extraterrestrials that were here on the Earth, they came from the Lyra and the Vega systems as well as from neighboring star systems. But something happened, and we don't know what it was exactly, but something happened in 1995 where these extraterrestrials um, left the Earth. They still visit Billy occasionally, and I still think we get visitors occasionally, but uh, they were here in mass for a while. But And they were also, they had a, in Mount Shasta, the Hyperboreans had a uh, a base which was here for a while. And you can see their golden-colored spacecraft coming out of the eastern side of that mountain there sometimes. But we are very much responsible now for what's going to happen here on the Earth. And that's why I've, I think I'm being drawn towards this incredible book. It's called The Might of the Thoughts, Mach der Gedanken. It's teaching us how, us to, how to control our thoughts because controlling our thoughts, for example, the peace meditation, which was today, uh, Salom Gamnan Ben Erda Ganiber Asala Hesperon, a peace to the earth and to all beings. We need to establish, reestablish peace on this earth. We can do it through our own thoughts, through practicing what real love is all about. 
Love is, the love of creation is everywhere because without it, nothing at all would be able to exist. The individual should therefore be aware that he exists only through the love of creation and that he carries this love within himself. And as I said earlier, all of nature in its indescribable splendor is nothing but the love of creation which is expressed visibly. Its laws are so wonderfully arranged that people everywhere come up against the radiating love of creation. Love is the purpose of existence, and love is all timely in its given logic. Nature can be defined as the natural world, as it exists without human beings or civilization. Nature can also be defined as the elements of the natural world, the mountains, the trees, the animals, the rivers. We use the word creation. The word creation in German is Schopfung. The German word for splendor is Procht. Splendor can mean a great and impressive beauty. The German word for Splendor is translated in different ways. Now, each plant and each ever so tiny animal was created in love by creation. And each creation existing according to the same law of love. All life is in the absolute perfection that which it should be through the love of creation. And except for humans, every life form lives exactly by creation's plan. Only humans can turn away from love. And we must now learn again what true love is. The infinite love of creation connects all life because in all life this love lies hidden. The universe that we live in is the material manifestation of the wisdom of creation. Wisdom is a kind of knowledge that produces energy. When we produce wisdom and its associated energy, we help the whole creation to evolve. The purpose of human life is to acquire wisdom. Love and wisdom belong together because creation and its laws are love and wisdom at the same time. Now, the earth human often speaks of love, and a love that he does not know. And love is based on reverence. And this reverence is the fundamental element of all existence. So it is therefore also the fundamental element of love, which is built, love is built on reverence. And since love is built on reverence, it is stable, true love, wisdom conditioned love. The emotion-based false form of love is subject to enormous fluctuations in its intensity and can thus suffer Changes and can even transform into rage and hatred. Wisdom conditioned love is a harmonious state of absolute connectedness with all things. And that form of love is indestructible. It's without temporal limits. Genuine love is a wellspring of eternal consistency, which in absolute it's absolutely independent of a human being's age, their personality, and their appearance. And Billy explains that love is essential for all evolution and for all life. Well, I appreciate everyone listening this evening and all the people that will listen to the archive. Keep sending the Meyer material. Keep practicing good thoughts. You are in control of the details of your life. You're in control of your own thoughts. Exercise that power. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for joining me. Have a good week.